All right. Um, so we have gone through the three different types of uh, samples that can be collected in a, in a well. Um, just to summarize those three, we have the open hole formation test type sample which is a uh, sample collected from a specific depth in the reservoir. Um, it can basically be used to collect samples from any type of reservoir. Um, it is becoming, or has become, perhaps the most common way of collecting samples. Um, it, it's, um, it's got uh, its uh, strong advantages over the other sampling methods. Um, there are some issues with it uh, that uh, we're not going to go into detail here about, but um, one of those, probably the most important, is that when you drill these wells, many of these wells today are drilled with oil-based mud, if you know what mud is at all. Anybody know what drilling mud is? Anybody know what, not know what drilling mud is? Okay, so everybody knows what drilling mud is. So historically, one used water base to, for drilling fluids, and it's more common to use uh, some kind of a, a diesel-like oil-based uh, 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 mixture to drill with. And what happens then is that you get leakage of some of the drilling fluid into the rock as you drill through it, because it's over pressure. You have more pressure in the well bore than in the reservoir, so you get some leakage of the of the liquid part of the mud into the reservoir. And in that case, it's an oil hydrocarbon mixture. So you've contaminated, if you will, the reservoir fluid with this artificial oil. And if you flow back locally from near the formation, what you're going to see for the most part in the beginning is just oil-based mud or the oil in oil-based mud flowing back. So you're not going to get a sample of what's actually in the reservoir. You're going to get a sample, as you saw in the video, of what's closest to the well bore. And it might take 20 minutes. It might take two hours before you start really seeing the reservoir fluid in any appreciable amount. So that can be a problem using this kind of open uh, hole formation tester that you you don't really get a sample of what is in situ in the reservoir itself. So that's, that's a potential problem. Um, otherwise, it's a reliable and generally a very reliable and useful uh, type of sample for any type of fluid system. The second sample was after you basically s completed the well, usually with casing, and perforated the well, you do a production test, and you send a wire line with the tool to the bottom and either during a low flow rate or a shut-in period you collect samples what's at the bottom of the well bore. Hence the name bottom hole sampler. But in this case you're getting a sample that's kind of a some kind of average of the perforation interval. Uh, the fluids in the perforation interval is some kind of average of those fluids. It's not a very depth specific sample. Um, and the third type of sample is the separator sample that is also collected during a production test while the well is flowing and it has lots of if, ands, and buts, any issues, a lot of issues about getting that sample to correctly represent what actually flowed into the separator. It can be done, you have to be diligent, and you have to you know, QC a number of things, but separator samples are very nice because you can collect a lot of them relatively inexpensively and you don't have any of this problem with the contamination with the oil-based mud and um, there are a lot of upsides to separator samples. Um, so generally I like uh, to have some of those, but um, in some producing provinces where it's very expensive, the rig time, the companies are now going away from doing any kind of production testing at all because they do these mini production tests 
locally and they know what fluids in the reservoir, they know approximately the permeability, things look good, why do the production test? So that's become more and more common. So anyway, now we're going to talk about, are there any questions about kind of sampling? Yes? Everything can give different results. The question is, what's the difference between wire line, case hole, bottom hole sampling, if the well's shut in, or if the well's flowing with a low rate? I can't send you to any really good guideline. This is better for this situation. This is better for that situation. Um, The idea is that if you use a, a wire line, cased hole, bottom hole sampler, you would like to sample when the fluid is single phase oil. So if it's highly, if it's highly overpressured reservoir, undersaturated, and you don't have a big drawdown, you know what flows into the well bore is single phase oil. Then you can actually run the, you know, take collect the samples with a low rate and. There's obviously some operational issues about collecting samples while it's flowing or shut in. I, I, I don't know. But in general, if it's single phase oil during the low flow rate or shut in, it shouldn't make much difference. Any other questions? Okay. So the next thing is what is the, uh, the laboratory going to do with these samples? And the first thing that we'll do with these samples, other than the QC that we talked about, is to determine the composition of each sample collected. Okay? So we're going to be determining or measuring the composition of the sample or samples in the case of separator. Well, of course, you're going to have multiple samples in all cases. So. And the composition, by, what, by composition, what we mean is the, um, the weight percent or the mass percent weight or mass percent, the molar percent of all the components. You've got your non-hydrocarbons, nitrogen, CO2, H2S if you're unlucky, methane, ethane, C6, and so forth. In addition to that, we, in basically going from the measurement of mass amounts to molar amounts, you also need to know something about the molecular weights to use to do that conversion. So you need to know something about molecular weight. So you also, in the lab, measure the molecular weight of a, well, I'll just, I'll just, I'll just say that you need, you need the component molecular weights to do this conversion of each component. And their heaviest component, which will I'll just write C in plus, the heaviest component that might be some laboratories from the 1970s and earlier would be seven. Uh, this would be up to about 1980. Uh, PVT reports through the 90s, um, maybe up to about 2000. This might be 10 or 15 plus, in other words, the last one. And then since then, after 2000, we basically have N is 25 plus, it might be 31 plus, and now what's very common is 36 plus. So you've progressively over time, the laboratories are providing a more and more detailed dis component description. So you basically have C7, C8, and, and on out there.
Okay. Determining composition of samples. So the first thing is that we use what's called a gas chromatograph. Okay. Anybody not heard of a gas chromatograph? Okay. Those who have heard about it probably don't know how it works. I mean, I don't even know, really know how it works. I mean, I can tell you stories, but, you know, I know what it measures. I don't know exactly the details of how it happens, but I'm going to try to give you a generic um, introduction. First, we've got this box. Used to be only Hewlett Packard made them, and now they are made by a bunch of different companies. <clears throat> and it's a temperature control box, so you basically have a temperature regulator. I'll ramp up the temperature. You have a basically a, a coil, a very small steel tube. And inside that tube is some material, some solid material. I don't know what the hell it is. Sorry. It's got some kind of solid material on it. And this is kind of a coil. It's a very long Okay. So, so you got something that goes into this device and you got something that goes out. And this long coil with some kind of material um, what we'll do is that we're going to inject continuously helium, I think. Okay. And then on the other side, there's this like detector. This is a detector. Detects stuff. <laughs> okay. Other than helium. And if it if it detects something, particularly a hydrocarbon, okay, if we're just flowing helium through here, then it will detect essentially nothing. It'll look kind of like, it'll just, basically it'll detect nothing. Okay. So, And it doesn't matter kind of what the temperature, you can run it at any temperature. If you're just in injecting helium, what will happen is that as we increase the temperature, you know, typically you have temperature being changed as a function of time. And you increase the temperature. So if we do nothing but just flow helium through this thing, then the detector is not really going to see anything and it's going to detect zero until you get to quite high temperatures and then it's going to start detecting something and it's basically it's getting so hot that the little that the packed material inside the tube is starting to evaporate something I don't know what it evaporates but something and it detects that something together with the helium okay so this response thing here, we call it a response, the magnitude of the detector, is basically zero if it's only flowing helium. Um, but then it might pick up some stuff from the packing material. The packing material, maybe it's got, I don't know what's on it. But. So this is for helium, helium only, okay? Now what we tend to do is that we will connect to this, we'll connect to this a sample. And this sample here will typically be a low pressure sample, okay? A low pressure sample, okay? Okay. 
a low pressure sample. And that, that sample will either be a stock tank oil, an oil that's like a, a stock tank oil, an oil that is in equilibrium at one atmosphere, okay? What I'll just call is a, an atmospheric oil. Or it can be a gas um, either a separator gas directly, that's acceptable, or an atmospheric gas. Okay. And that sample will be injected with the syringe or, you know, pushed in, just a small amount, and it will flow together with the helium through here. And then when that happens, we're going to get two types of responses. If we send in an atmospheric oil, then it's going to get a little bit of response for methane. Okay? Because this time or temperature, and, and I, I didn't draw this curve here, as the time goes on during a, during a run, the temperature increases. And at some particular time, you reach a temperature where methane, when the methane in the mixture and the ethane and everything, when, when the mixture goes in at a cold temperature, it just sticks to the stuff inside the tube, the packing material. It just absorbs to it, sticks to it. Okay? You inject it, cold temperature, and you see nothing coming out if you don't increase the temperature. It just, the methane, everything sticks to this packing material. But as you start heating it, you reach a certain temperature, the methane kind of boils off and flows together with the helium as a gas. And then you get this little registration at that time or that temperature of a little bit of stuff. Well, it's an atmospheric oil, so there's not much methane in there, right? Okay, so this should be green. This is an oil analysis. And then the ethane, there might be a little bit. You get a little bit of propane. Iso normal butane, iso normal pentane, and you get a bunch of C6s, and before the C6s are done, you're getting C7s, and then you, this thing is going to go, it's going to like, there's so many isomers that are boiling off, flowing with the helium, being detected, that this thing will kind of start looking like a continuous thing like this. Okay. So this would be, this was C7, you know, C10, C20 out here, and, and so forth. And the, the area between here and here, which is all of these components that they consider to be boiling off as part of the C7 group, this area under that curve is proportional with the mass of that material. Okay, the area is proportional with mass. So you've got just a very little bit of mass for the methane. And of course, as you get to the heavier components, you've got maybe out here C30, you got a, and you only integrate the area from this baseline, okay, up to the actual curve. Area is proportional to mass. <clears throat> so what we end up with basically is your component, you know, methane, ethane, all the way down, and we basically get an area for each component. And we have to figure out a way to translate that into mass. And the way that's done is that they, they kind of do a tricky thing um, for the oil case. For, this is, we're looking at this case now. 
for the oil case, you've got this thing full of oil here. What they do is they add, I don't know what color I want to add to it, they add this five weight percent of some odd component that's not found in reservoir fluids. Okay? Some strange component. You know, it might be C6 component or C8 component. I don't know. It's, it just depends. And it's this strange component. And that component is going to, we add, we know the weight percent we, because we add so much mass of that into the total oil sample. So we know it's got, let's say, five weight percent. And then that, that component shows up here. And we know that that area, the area of our, and they call this a, um, what do they call it? Uh, internal standard. Okay. This is an internal standard. Okay. We know that area now. And we know that corresponds to five weight percent. So then we have this way to translate any area to weight percent. Okay. So that's, so basically we use this internal standard methodology to make the translation from area to mass, fraction. And then we get to the final CN plus, okay? And the problem is we don't know that area because it's, it's like we didn't run it that far, okay? We, we, stopped, we stopped the chromatograph. So we just simply don't know what that area is, okay? But we know how to convert all of the ones before it, right? And these are on these are on a, a not a mass, but it's a mass percentage. Okay. So we know that this final amount is 100 minus the sum of all of the ones lighter. This is the sum of from I equals 1 to n minus 1, right? So it actually, you can, you, can, you can back calculate what is the mass fraction of this remaining stuff by difference. So we take an oil sample, we spike it with 5% of some internal standard, some strange component, we mix it all up, we inject a little bit of CC of this together with the helium, and we get this signature plot. Uh, the chromatograph does the integration for you, um, and it gives you these areas. It does the conversion to the mass fractions, and then it calculates the remaining mass fraction. Okay, that's gas chromatography in a, in a very simplified kind of approximately correct description. Any questions about that? We usually don't call this mass, usually because it's kind of a weight percentage. In the book, we call it weight fraction, mass fraction. It's by definition the mass of the component over the total mass there. So that's what it will look like for this one here. If we instead send a gas into this chromatograph, it will have a different signature. Um, I'll, I'll draw another figure so I don't. This is temperature or time. Okay. Response. And now we're going to do it for the gas. Now for the gas, it's got a lot of methane. 
you know, quite a bit of ethane, propane, iso normal C4, iso normal C5, and then you start getting C6, C7, but you don't have very much of these. Okay? So it'll look something like that. So for gases, you don't need an internal standard because you basically, this goes to zero. Okay? So you know the total area just by integrating everything. So this was the weight fractions of the oil. This gives us the weight fractions of a gas. And yeah, so that's, that's how we get these relative amounts. Any questions about that? So this is they have a little different, to get the nitrogen and CO2 and H2S, they have a little different chromatograph they send it through, I think. So it's, it's, it's uh, I won't get into that detail. So now, okay, so this is just general gas chromatography, the methodology. It measures mass fractions. Um, it does it of either atmospheric oils or separator gases or atmospheric gases. That's, it, you can't take this bottom hole sample from the MDT tel, tool and, and inject it directly into the GC. It won't work. They've tried it, it doesn't work. That's not how, that's not how it works. So, now we're going to talk about pressurized samples. That will include all bottom hole samples of all types. And separator oils. Separator gas we can send usually directly to the GC. It's no big deal. But for all bottom hole samples and for separator oil, and this is what I call pressurized samples, we have to have an extra laboratory step or procedure before we go to the gas chromatograph. So now on these, the first step is to do a flash equilibrium. at one atmosphere and some temperature, T star, okay? Now, it'll often be close to ambient temperature in the laboratory. It'll be close to, might be less than or higher than your 60 degrees Fahrenheit, but it doesn't have to be 60 degrees Fahrenheit. So we do a flash equilibrium. So we start with this container with our pressurized sample. Okay. It'll be single single phase. Whatever pressure and temperature needed to make sure it's single phase. Okay. And then we take it in the laboratory to a separator. at standard pressure and some temperature. And we evolve gas and we evolve oil. I'll write it this way because these are standard condition, standard pressure, gas and oil. We measure the, the volume of that We'll know the moles of it and the mass 
of that gas. And likewise here, the mass of the oil will measure its density, therefore we have the oil volume, we'll measure its molecular weight, and therefore we get the, um, the moles of that oil. Okay, So these we have to measure. To make the translation from weighed mass to volume in moles. For the gas, it's relatively easy to get. If you have volume, you have moles, you have mass, it doesn't matter. Okay. The most important part is getting the moles here and getting the moles there. That's and 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 the mass, I guess you could say that's also important to get those right. <clears throat> so, this requires some metering or direct measurements of, you know, of the volumes, amounts. This involves both metering and basically weighing, weighing this, and property measurement. Then we take the sample to the GC box. Okay. We get our chromatogram. It has the signature. That. We take the oil sample to the GC, we get a slightly different signature. Like that. This gives us the weight fractions of each component in the gas. This gives us the weight fractions of the components in the oil. We have that thing here, internal standard. And then we do part two of this. Well, really, the GC is kind of part two. And then part three is to do a recombination of the surface gas and the surface oil to get the original sample composition. That's the original sample. Uh, so, as we're waiting for the last uh, probably it goes into this like automatic system after uh, if you're not touching or doing things with it, it uh, plays um, so now we've got the basically the mass of the flash gas we've got the mass of the flash oil in terms of grams for example we've got the mass fraction of each component in the gas and the mass fraction of each component in the oil now we can just do this very simple accounting, adding up masses of each component to get the overall mass fraction for the entire um, uh, for the entire original sample. I don't need to write it for you, basically, but that's that's I, I will do it once we get this back. But that's basically what we're doing. We know the mass of this flash gas total, mass of the flash oil total, and we know how it's dissected into the mass fraction of I, component I in the gas phase and the mass of component I in the oil phase. So we're able to calculate component mass amounts, add them together, then we have mass amounts for the total mixture. So, any questions about, about that? Now, once we've done that, 
the laboratory could say we're done, but usually we need to use mole fractions and not mass fractions in our PVT models. Our, most of our PVT models, you need mole fractions. Remember, to calculate the gas Z factor, you need to calculate the pseudocritical pressure, pseudocritical temperature. You need the gas molar composition. It doesn't use weight fractions. So we have to convert the mass fractions to mole fractions. And to do that, we need the molecular weight of each component. Okay. So I'll just summarize this. So the total mass of component I is the mass of the gas times the weight fraction component I plus the mass of the oil times the weight fraction component I in the oil. And then the total, of course, weight fraction distribution is just mi over the total sum of all the moles. All of the masses. But we also need the mole fractions so to get those we basically, the laboratory will, what the lab will do is that it will calculate <coughs> kind of like this. It will calculate the mole of each component will be the, um, you can either use MI or WI. Since it reports WI, I'll give you that. The weight fraction divided by the molecular weight. Of that component. And then the mole fraction, if it was a bottom mole sample, it would be ZI if it's a separator oil sample, it would be Xi, basically the mole fraction, depending what kind of sample it is. That's just basically the moles here divided by the total moles of all the components, where we calculate the moles here. The problem is where do we get these mole molar masses or the molecular weights. That's the problem. Well, for all of the light components, H2S, CO2, nitrogen, C1 through C5s, ISO and normal, these came from nature, God, whoever you believe in. They're there. They're numbers. They're fixed. They're unique in a sense. But for the C6, the C7, on and on and on until we finally get to the CN plus. These will differ either somewhat from one field to the next because we have different amount of isomers in the C7 component in one field than the other field. Okay, one field has a lot of benzene that we put in the C7. The other field has no benzene in the C7. So their molecular weight could be quite different. Okay? So these will differ somewhat field to field. But most important is that the molecular weight of this one, of this heaviest one, this can have a huge variation from field to field. Not somewhat, but we can have large variation field to field, or reservoir fluid to reservoir fluid.
that'll do is I'll say since I since I put differ somewhat in this, I'll stop that here. So, so typically what we do is that the lab usually has some kind of internal average molecular weights for the single carbon numbers I from 7 out to N minus 1. They just say we're going to use a set of molecular weights. If you don't like them, you can change them and use your own. But the lab basically will tell you what those numbers are. They might be from, for example, chapter 5, table 5.2. Is Some of the labs use that by Katz and Fears of Body. Other labs use different numbers. But the point is they have their own set of lab values and they will use those. But the lab measured directly the molecular weight of the total stock tank oil, the flashed oil. Okay? They, it's, a, it's a device called a, it's a cryoscopic device that uses the principle of how the freezing point changes from a pure benzene to the freezing point if you add a little bit of some other hydrocarbon. The freezing point will, will lower and it's called freezing point depression and if you measure how how much depression that depression of the freezing point of benzene according to which hydrocarbon you have in it that is a strong correlation to the molecular weight of that contaminant in the benzene in this case it's an oil so you put just a little bit of the oil in the benzene you measure how much the freezing point decreases and that gives you the molecular weight. Well, unfortunately, this uncertainty in this measurement is somewhere between 2 and 10 or greater percent. It's not the most accurate measurement around. But they, have, they do have the measurement. They give you a number, 232. You just don't believe the two part, <laughs> or the last two. It might be 220, it might be 248, okay? But they'll give you a number. Okay. So, in order to find this guy, they find that by back calculation, by material balance. Okay? So basically, they have the measured lab value. This should equal the sum of all of the weight fractions. That's the total mass. Of course, that'll equal 1 divided by the moles, which is that term, from 1 to n minus 1. We have all of these terms, plus the weight fraction of the heaviest divided by its molecular weight. This is the guy we're looking for. Okay? But, we know we measure this, we measure these, we measure those, and we have those are lab values. They tell you what they are, good or bad. They measure this. So you can basically back calculate this molecular weight of the heaviest. That's what they do. And then once they have this whole suite of molecular weights, they can do this conversion here from, mole, from mass to moles.
So anyway, that basically summarizes. That gives you the composition, both in mass and moles, of any kind of sample. Thanks for suffering through the, I know it's not exciting stuff, but it is kind of important. So any questions before we break? We're over time. All right.